Good afternoon and welcome to Christ Church here in Constantia on behalf of the Archbishop of Cape Town, Archbishop Taba Machoba and also my Bishop Garth who is, I extend to you a very warm welcome as we gather to give thanks to God for the life of Alex Bahrain as we celebrate his life and as we thank God for him. The service is built around instructions that were left by him. It includes mostly uh, input from his children and grandchildren um, as we gather to give thanks to God. We're going to try and stick to the program as set out without too many interruptions in between. But the family have asked me to acknowledge she's just arrived. Our Deputy Minister Zokota Fredericks, who has just arrived, is representing uh, the official representative of the South African government. And then they've asked me to mention that there was a message sent from the presidency by Cass Lubisi that uh, two family friends um, are very pained uh, by not able to be and attend here today, Minister Noendia Mfuketu and Deputy Minister and Sabisi Squatcher, who both have asked to convey their apologies to the family. And they very proudly recall how your dad and your mom gave them secure shelter in your family home when the party security forces sought to arrest and imprison them. So I invite you to become quiet and silence your heart and mind as we gather before God with sadness in our hearts for the loss that Jenny and her family have suffered, that our country mourns today, but also for the joy of a brave and courageous witness of this child of God. St. Paul wrote, God shows his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Job says, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then the prophet Isaiah, from whom Alex draw, drew so much strength and encouragement, wrote, he will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. As we sit, I invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Let us pray. God, our Father, your Son, Jesus Christ, died and rose again for our salvation. We entrust to you the soul of your Son and servant, Alex Lionel, praying that he and all the faithful departed may be revealed as your children when Christ shall come again to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honour and glory, now and for ever. Amen. Call on Angela. On behalf of the Bahrain family, I'd like to welcome you all here today. We thank you for being here and for celebrating Grandpa's life with us. I would also like to acknowledge the wonderful messages from friends and people around the world we've received in the past week. They are deeply appreciated. I would now like to read a meditation taken from the Jewish prayer book. When I die, give what's left of me away to children and old men who wait to die. And if you need to cry, cry for your brother walking the street beside you. And when you need me, put your arms around anyone and give them what you need to give me. I want to leave you something, something better than words or sounds. Look for me in the people I've loved or known. And if you can't give me away, at least let me live in your eyes and not in your mind. 
You can love me best by letting hands touch hands and by letting go of children that need to be free. Love doesn't die, people do. So, when all that's left of me is love, give me away. Our dad used to tell us wonderful stories when we were young. And we used to say, tell us another one from the mouth. Which meant a story that he made up rather than reading a book. Now dad was also a great storyteller through his sermons his marvelous story about the errant knight and his faithful companion is referenced in the booklet. He was also a great storyteller through his speeches, his talks, his lectures and his writings. But Dad was not just a powerful storyteller, he was also a good listener. He had an abiding interest in other people's stories. In particular, he loved listening to young people's stories through his work in the Methodist Youth Department and the National Youth Leadership Training Program in the 1960s, right through his whole life to listening to his grandchildren's stories last week. And I remember how he was deeply affected by listening to the 20,000 testimonies with his colleagues on the TRC hearings. So I would say that one of Dad's skills was being able to successfully combine the dialectic, the art of debating different points of view, learned during the cut and thrust of the political process, with the dialogic, an ability to listen, and a way of leading that uncovers, through conversation, the hidden creative potential in any situation. Now, Dad was also influenced by the countercultural movements of the 1960s and was never afraid to do things differently, even at a memorial service. So, in honor of Dad's storytelling, and his ability to bring people together, often in unconventional ways, I invite you to each share a short story of your own. I invite you to please turn to the person next to you, or behind you, or in front of you, and share a story about your connection with Alex, how you first met him, or worked with him, or knew him through the family, or heard him speak, or how he affected your life. And if you haven't heard of Alex, and you're at the wrong memorial, <laughs> well, make up a good story anyway. <laughs> From the mouth. Dad loved music, particularly the songs of Abdullah Ibrahim. We will play Chisa, a song that speaks of the classic Cape Town Goma rhythm, in the background for a couple of minutes. When you hear the trumpets kick in around 4.15 in the song, your time is up. I invite you to talk to each other. Thank you. 
Okay. So that's, that's what you call an icebreaker. Okay. Um, in closing, we would appreciate it if you could continue to tell stories about yourself and Alex to help us commemorate his life and work and your connection to him and your connection to each other. An email address is included in the order of service. If you feel so inclined, please record a voice note. Ask your grandchildren to help you record a voice note. <laughs> or jot down a story or scan a photograph and send them to us. We would be very grateful. Thank you. I will be reading from Isaiah chapter 58, verses 6 to 12. Is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen? To loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke, to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter? When you see the naked to clothe them, and not turn away from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you, and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Uh, I'm going to be reading Corinthians Corinthians 13, I believe. Yes, verses 1 through 6. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship, that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, sorry, love is patient, love is kind, it does not envy, and it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others and it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Thank you, Father. I didn't know it took so long to get up to up to here from a front row seat. Our deepest condolences, Leah and mine, to you, Jenny, and all your dear family. It is a great honor to have been allowed this time to pay my tribute to a great South African. It would have been fitting for our president to give Alex an official funeral. I am sad that this has not happened. 
Our country owes Alex a great debt of gratitude for the outstanding work he did as White Vice Chairperson of the TRC, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. When we came into being, we had absolutely nothing. No premises, no vehicles, absolutely nothing. And in next to no time, Alex ensured that we had offices, we had vehicles, we had ancillary stuff in Cape Town, in Johannesburg, in Natal, and in the Eastern Cape. Otherwise, we would not have begun an onerous task in time. I'm afraid if people we're doling out congratulations and chose me to be the recipient. They were wrong. Very considerable credit must go to Alex and to the regional leaders in Durban, in Johannesburg, in East London, and in Cape Town. <coughs> Our country owes Alex a huge debt of gratitude. He ensured that our outstanding team of commissioners and committee members, as well as our dedicated and conscientious staff, did the splendid work of lancing the boil that was caused by many, many years of oppression and injustice. Our country could so easily have gone up in flames. We give great thanks to God for all the people who were the TRC and the many, many so-called ordinary women and men of our land who came to lance the boil of injustice and oppression and give us a very good chance of building a wonderful land for all its women and men, young women, young men, and our children. And of these, Alex Brain stood tall. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you and your family for having sacrificed so much in letting your husband and father give us conscientiously, so selflessly, so generously for our beloved country. May he rest in peace and rise in glory. Thank you, Father. It is said by the Superintendent Minister of Wesley's Chapel in London that Methodism was born in song. Methodists have always sung their theology. Charles Wesley wrote for the streets of his time, for down at heel people, for the unlearned, for a church on the move. Charles Wesley democratized church music, released it from the hands of the super skilled and gave it to ordinary people. Alex always loved this aspect of the Methodist church. And this popular hymn we're about to sing um, has a Welsh hymn melody. 
and Alex believed that he, well, he knew that he was, um, he had a rich Welsh ancestry, Evans being the family name, and he absolutely loved hearing Welsh voices sing. So I think we're all about one sixtieth percent Welsh in us, so we'll stand and hear just exactly how much we have. Please be seated as we hear tributes now from two of the sons sandwiched in the middle by a fellow book clubber. Hello everybody, thank you for being here today and thank you for the numerous messages to our family. Never let it be said that kindness doesn't matter. In 1976, we were living in Boston of all places. I was 12. My father gave a sermon and afterwards someone asked me, So Jeremy, what did you think of your father's service? I replied, I'm glad it was short. <laughs> Alex always believed in keeping speeches short, quite rare for a politician. So in honor of him, I will keep this brief. Much is known of his public life, so I'm going to talk about the father I knew. One of my dad's greatest passions was tennis, and in years gone by, he and I spent many Saturday afternoons battling it out on the court. He never gave me quarter. It took me years and years of losing and sweating and cursing before I finally, yes, beat him. We didn't play many singles games after that. <laughs> Alex liked to win, and he certainly didn't much like to lose. For those of you who never saw Alex play, it was a sight to behold. He had an extraordinary forearm shot that blasted the ball to both corners of the court. By his own account, he played like a champion, and he wasn't shy of shouting out, What a shot! <laughs> or did you see that? You could be certain that this was half spontaneous joy, but also half deliberate to irritate the hell out of the opposition, to put them off their game. He was good at that. His backhand, I'm afraid, was a different story. I never told him this, but I called it the chicken wing shot. It was bad, and he knew it. He did all in his power to protect his left side. He would run around it, or charge the net, 
or when it came to doubles, would always put himself on the right-hand side so he could use his forearm. Play to your strengths, right? And protect or hide those weaknesses. Alex could get very angry both on and off the court, and with a look, he could burn a hole right through you. I remember one Saturday morning, I was a student living in an observatory, and after a wonderful Friday night party where much cheap red wine had been consumed, I was awoken by insistent knocking on the front door. There was my father, dressed from head to toe in his tennis whites. I had completely forgotten about our arrangement. He insisted we play, despite my hangover. He was furious. I was dismal. The game was brutal. Played in silence, he whipped my arts. <laughs> he traveled, Dad traveled often, and when I was young, I spent hours knocking a tennis ball against the garage wall, practicing for the day when I would beat him. He spent days and weeks and even months away studying, giving sermons, speeches, meetings, politicking. He had an incredible appetite for work. I often missed him when he was out in the world and longed for him to be at home. As children, we had to share him with the public. And yet, when he was at home, he was intensely interested in all of us. He found time for each one of us with our different pursuits and idiosyncrasies. Whether it was tennis or food or writing or music or books, long after our childhoods were over, he remained curious in all that we did. In the last 10 years, he, one could expect a call just about every week wanting to know, how are you? How's the family? Did you see the match between Federer and Djokovic? And his favorite question, what are you having for dinner? <laughs> he liked food. Alex loved to laugh, particularly at his own jokes. I remember funny accents and even funnier faces, and puns and jokes and tall tales. Often it was something spontaneous. Once, when I was very young, our family stopped overnight in Grahamstown en route to somewhere. We all went off to the local cinema to see a western. A tense moment in the film, the wagons in circle, a settler walks over to a wagon, draws aside the curtain, and at precisely the moment the Indian brave cleaves the settler's head, my father shouted out, CHOP! <laughs> the, the audience collapsed in laughter. We children squirmed with embarrassment and secret relief that he had removed the horror of a bloody murder. Dad grinned from ear to ear. Dad had a great zest for life and was ever the optimist. Back on the tennis court, we could be all but buried, five love down, and Dad would take me aside. Okay, Jeremy, just focus on winning the next game. Do that and the set's ours for the taking. In his last few years, Alex wasn't very mobile. My brother Andrew and I would join him at his home to watch a bit of rugby. Anyone who's a fan of the national team knows that being a Springbok supporter isn't easy these days. But not for Dad. We'd walk through the door of his home and he'd confidently say, the Springboks are going to thrash them by 30 points. Sometimes he was right. In the days before Dad died, he was lucid. In the day, I saw him the day before he died. He was lucid one moment, confused the next. And at one point he spoke out clearly to me. I think it's time for a drink. Ever the optimist. Cheers, Dad. Here's to you. I speak by kind invitation of Jenny and the BBC. Not the one out there, the renowned one, the Bahrain Book Club. <laughs> it's better known, of course, as the Boys' Big Adventure Club. This was one of the last initiatives which Alex took in his long and fruitful life. And to the companions which he assembled there, it was a matter for which we have really, truly benefited from his combination of moral purpose, dedication, a really good selection of good detective stories, and of course, a consummating uh, interest in 
the political gossip which kept him and my generation well and truly on our toes. It is not often in one's life that one makes a new old friend, but this was certainly the case for those companions of Alex who had not previously known him who joined the BBC. We found that Alex was a man of the book in many senses of the word, a man of deeds, and indeed a man of words. He struggled to write, but did so, and with deep intention and meaning. He invited us all to write about what we thought of our deaths soon to come, as indeed he did of his own. Socrates opined that the unexamined life is not worth living. Alex, for me, is an outstanding example of a man who lived an examined life and infused with his own sense of moral purpose in a light-hearted but deeply encompassing way that particular act, an examined life. Just imagine them all naked. That's what he used to tell me. <laughs> if it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now, yet it will come. The readiness is all from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Alex Borain was nothing if not ready for everything, ready to fight, ready to love, ready to live, ready to change course, ready to forgive, ready to help, to listen, to speak, to laugh and to cry. But as a storyteller, I am also ready to admit that conflict and struggle are necessary for any good story and his was a good story. As a family, we struggled to share him with the world. For us, he was just dad. But his life of service meant that we had to very often take a back seat. We all struggled with that to some degree. And there were times when I wished he would stop healing a nation, reconciling differences or uncovering the truth and just sit down and play a game of Monopoly, damn it. However, he also had the good sense to grow old, to mellow with age and to engage with his family on a much deeper level. He developed over time an intimate and individual relationship with each one of us as kids, calling regularly, endlessly discussing food, as has already been mentioned. <laughs> food was critically important. The details of each meal became a way to connect. You did make the best tomato breedy ever, Dad. His growing old meant that we had time to grow up and to acknowledge just how privileged we were to have him as a father. I realize it was not a loss to share him with the world, but a great honor. As a father myself, I now realize how hard it is to balance personal ambition with the needs of my child, and I can see that one of the greatest gifts that he gave me was to live a full and fulfilled life himself. There are so many stories. But there's one story that always rings true for me. Um, 
because it happened even before I was born, but it was kind of passed down by osmosis in the family. <clears throat> 1970s, maybe even 1970, 1969, 1970, Evans Road in Durban. And uh, Jenny and Alex would take Cassie, the little canned terrier with a bad attitude, for a walk every night. And um, as they would come back, there was a, a beetle, a VW beetle parked there, Folksy. And uh, in it would be two members of the security branch sitting there monitoring and uh, smoking cigarettes, you know, to the, as the evening fell. And uh, my dad would get so cross. And there were 39 steps up to our house. And uh, he would walk up those 39 steps and sort of cursing and swearing and saying, how can they just sit there monitoring us like that and smoking? <laughs> Wasn't sure which he was more angry about. But when they got to the top one evening, my mum turned to him and said, oh, for goodness sake, Alex, stop moaning and make them a plate of sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Which he did. <laughs> and he took them down the 39 steps. And he knocked on the folksy window. And these two guys stubbed out the cigarettes and uh, turned to him, rolled down the window. <gasps> and uh, he said, are you hungry? And they said, yeah, we are young guys, you know. And they took the sandwiches. And I love that story about my dad because it says so much about his moral philosophy. But I love that story too, because actually the story is about my mum. <laughs> she not only gave him a family, created many beautiful homes, tended gardens for him to sit in and cook many delicious meals, but also assisted him with difficult decisions regarding his work and his writing, tirelessly supported all his efforts in public life, guiding him to think positively and challenging him to tell his truth. She was not merely a partner, but integral to his moral philosophy, as the sandwich story illustrates. For the man who presented such a clear vision, when his own path was not always clear, she was the one who showed him the way. She too would change course when he changed course, sometimes at great personal cost to herself, ready to tack into the wind for his next brave adventure. Even if that wind was a raging southeaster, she was there, holding the tiller and keeping the boat steady. He was ready, she was steady. Only then could they go. You know, I think the one word he uttered more than anything else in his life was, Jenny! <laughs> Jenny! Jenny, where, where is your mother? <laughs> Jenny! Alex knew just how much Jenny meant in his life. And I'd like to ask Scarlett, my daughter, to pick up one of the red roses at the front and just give it to my mum. <laughs> just to acknowledge her role. Thank you, Dad, for everything. I will miss you and I love you. It was while studying in the United States of America in the 1960s that Alex became, became involved in the civil rights movement and worked with Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders. This activity and engagement of his influenced both his theology and politics on his return to South Africa. Amazing Grace is a Christian hymn published in 1779 with words written by the English poet, an Anglican clergyman, 
John Newton. It became an emblematic African-American spiritual in the United States back then and the anthem for the civil rights movement. We stand now to sing the hymn Amazing Grace. Please be seated. I will try to follow Nick's injunction and be brief, but there is so much to tell. Thank you, Jenny and all the family, for allowing me this opportunity to pay tribute to Alex. Alex Borain lived in interesting times, and he himself contributed towards the changes which made those times interesting for all South Africans. His youthful experiences, his studies in theology at Rhodes, Oxford, and Drew universities, his ministry in the Methodist Church, all prepared him for a life of thoughtfulness and action. As the young president of the Methodist Church, he was already demonstrating his capacity for leadership and organization. All this week, people who knew Alex have been writing or telling of their experiences of knowing him over the years, adding to the stories. A day or two ago, Dr. Stuart Saunders was recounting to me how at the start of the 1970s, Harry Oppenheimer drew Alex into the Anglo-American corporate structures to work on employment practices in a time of the cruelties of migrant labor. Oppenheimer clearly recognized ability and leadership when he saw it. Inevitably, Alex was drawn into politics, campaigning for the Progressive Party. In 1974, he was part of the, 
and I quote from Joyce Harris, a one-time president of the Black Sash, of the surprising and heartening success which broke the logjam in which the political setup in this country has been immobilized for so many years. Seven Progressive Party representatives were elected to Parliament. But amidst much rejoicing, Harris asked, is it enough? Or is there a far more urgent need for a realignment that is sufficiently drastic to ensure that there will actually be change? That was also the question that exercised the minds of the Progressive Party leaders for the next dozen years. They were years that brought momentous changes in Africa and growing dissent in South Africa. In 1976, the Soweto youth protests set alight a national uprising of frustration and anger among young people, evidence of a new generation which would no longer bow to a seemingly inevitable future of ongoing injustice and discrimination. 1977 brought the growing influence of the black consciousness movement. The appalling killing in September of that year of Steve Bantubiko and in October, the banning of a range of organizations supporting the rights of black South Africans, as well as major newspapers. The political and economic cost of maintaining white rule was growing and becoming more visible. Black leaders were bearing the brunt of the repression. Alex himself wrote in 1979 of those final years of the decade, about Biko, he said, if ever a man had more influence in his death than in a short and yet spectacular life, it is Steve Biko. About the consequences of repression of protest, he agonized so many people dead and so many homes smashed, so many people in jail and so many becoming exiles and a tremendous legacy of hatred, anger, and fear. Progressive Party public representatives were under pressure to respond to the ruling party's proposals for changes to create the supposedly independent Bantustans, to draft a new constitution, to find ways to satisfy growing national and international criticism without losing control. Members of the party Provincial council members, too, were calling on their MPs to intervene in situations all over the country which demonstrated the misery of forced removals, of grinding poverty, of brutal conditions in prisons and vicious treatment by police, of detentions without trials, and of the growing anger which all these injustices created. Alex would find himself called on to go to small towns, to big meetings, and all too often to funerals. By the start of the 1980s, this growing turmoil was leading to increased rejection of the role of parliamentary opposition within an unrepresentative parliament. In different parts of the country, small but growing groups were forming organizations to build the power of ordinary people to manage their own lives and to resist apartheid structures. Whether the focus was on education, housing, land, health, faith groups, local government, municipal policing, or other community issues, people were organizing themselves into political pressure groups and acquiring valuable political and leadership skills. One only has to think of the parts played by the men who were to become known as the Craddock Four, Matthew Goniwe, Fort Kalata, Sparrow Mkonto, and Sikhnelo Mklaoli, to understand how this groundswell led to the development of extra-parliamentary political activity. By 1983, this had coalesced into the launch of the United Democratic Front. A state repression, both provoked 
and responded to community protests, violence spread. Who can forget the killings of the Craddock Four in June 1985 and their funeral which led directly to the proclamation of a state of emergency? Who can forget the car smash at the end of that year in December 1985 which killed Molly Blackburn and Brian Bishop and injured Di Bishop and uh, her sister Judy Chalmers. Thousands killed, injured, detained and tortured at a huge cost to the economy and government's attempts to make superficial changes were clearly inadequate. It must surely have been impossible for Alex and for his colleague Frederick von Selslavert not to be affected by all these events. There must have been many discussions within the party and with other groupings as to the way forward. How much influence could they exert? What was the best way to push for really meaningful change? Within South Africa and beyond, there must have been many consultations, but of necessity they would have required considerable discretion. For these two at least, those discussions were over by 1986. And at the beginning of that parliamentary session, they announced that they would leave Parliament and dedicate themselves to other ways of working for change. Alex is quoted as saying, there are people and organisations who would like to take part in the constitutional process, but who can't be in this House, who can't participate in this debate. He added that the racially entrenched tricameral system was a disservice to Parliament. Their decision caused considerable distress within the Progressive Party and its supporters. And I remember well that within the Black Sash, there were those who were utterly devastated and those who were closer to the United Democratic Front who were absolutely elated at this new step in bringing about change. It opened other opportunities for dialogue with a wide range of organizations and individuals. In November that year, they launched the Institute for a Democratic Alternative in South Africa, IDASA. Branches in other centers followed. Conferences provided opportunities for a wide range of discussions, individual meetings between the two of them um, with representatives of the still banned African National Congress. I think of all the work and preparation that must have gone into that time, and I think of Alex's drive and energy and vision, and I remember him hearing talking, uh, particularly on the question of fundraising, that he and Fonseil would go into potential donors, and Fonseil would sell them the vision, and Alex would demand the cash. <laughs> <laughs> and it must have been a huge enterprise. In July 1987, a meeting was organized by IDASA in Dakar, Senegal, bringing together ANC representatives led by Thabo Mbeki with a delegation from South Africa of mainly Afrikaans-speaking leaders in a wide variety of fields, journalists, politicians, business people, and so on. Even today, that meeting is seen as a turning point in this country's history, one that had far-reaching effects on those who participated and more widely on South African politics. Further meetings followed. There was a major international conference in Arusha with the theme World United Against Apartheid, which led to the Arusha Declaration. Yet, the machinery of apartheid dragged on. But the future of South Africa was being planned outside of Parliament for over two more years. 1990 finally brought an end to formal apartheid and Alex played his part in all the strands which finally led to the democratic elections. But most of all, he was planning for the transitional processes that would have to deal with the horrors of the past. Archbishop Desmond has, token of, has spoken of his huge contribution to the TRC. And indeed, many things would simply not have happened if it hadn't been for Alex's organizing ability and his determination that it was going to do its task. But perhaps even more important for the world 
is the way in which that extraordinary experience that South Africa went through was translated into opportunities for other countries emerging from periods of conflict to devise for themselves a way of working towards reconciliation. Not cheap reconciliation, not reconciliation without some justice, but rec reconciliation which did not necessarily lead to retribution. And through the establishment of the International Center for Transitional Justice, that work has been spread all over the world. Alex was a man, as I've said, of vision and of energy, and he leaves a huge footprint for all of us to follow. He has been received many awards, he has been on, offered, honored in different countries of the world. Um, yes, maybe he should have had a state funeral, but here we all are together to remember him and to pay tribute to his family who supported him all the way through, and of course especially to Jenny, who partnered him every inch of the way. I think that he is, will be remembered for a very long time as an architect of reconciliation without abandoning concepts of justice. And we are all the better for having had this experience of having this man in our lives. And while we were telling stories from the mouth, the story that I heard was one of Alex as a concerned, courteous, um, and deeply personal listener. And I think that's a hugely important characteristic and not one that is always common in such public figures. Thank you again to all the family and our sympathy and love to all of you. Those were enormous shoes. I think size 11 or 12. And I just want to speak very, very briefly about that aspect of him which sustained us all perhaps more than his words and deeds, sometimes. Because beyond the words and deeds, and I wanted to address him, beyond the words and deeds of your life, Dad, were your hugs. Your huge, enormous, warm hugs. The hum of that heart-to-heart -heart was where the world could wait. And for a moment, we embraced grace. It was home, and how I knew the love we shared was stronger than anything that could pull us apart. And through those moments, too, I knew what you had learned through embracing the world with such courage and curiosity, that we could surrender again and again to kindness, to comfort, to compassion. This was the food that you and Jenny nourished us with. On all your journeys with us, that was the aim, to love with all our heart. In the past few years, you turned yourself towards your final adventure. With reluctance, as living and embracing life was your passion. And you told me how curious you were about dying and you'd like to be present at the time of your passing. Transitional justice, you might have called it. In the last few days, you so daily wanted to carry on and be with us all, but you were so, so tired. In the end, though, it was the luminous light of you and Jenny's collective wisdom that saw you through. She stood at the end of your bed, not wanting to disturb you, in the dark, and said, taking from Star Trek all the movies she had to watch while he was away, Beam him up, Scotty. <laughs> and a few hours later, we find you smiling, your last smile, 
with your hands over your chest in a final embrace, your eyes open softly, so present. What an adventure. Thanks, Dad. Thanks, Mum. Thanks, family. And thanks to all of you who sustained us all those long years. So this was a request song for Alex. My sister and I are going to sing. <clears throat> next verse. I'll be reading an excerpt from the breath of the ancestors. Listen to things more often than beings. Hear the voice of fire, hear the voice of water. Listen to the wind, to the size of the bush. This is the ancestors breathing. Those who are dead are not ever gone. Those, they are in the darkness that grows lighter and in the darkness that grows darker. The dead are not down in the earth, 
They are in the trembling of the trees, in the groaning of the woods, in the water that runs, in the water that sleeps. They are in the hut, they are in the crowd. The dead are not dead. I love you, Gramps. Some months ago, um, Alex called the office to ask if he could have some time with me, which um, I agreed to, and we met for about an hour while Jenny had gone off to collect medication and see her own specialist for one of her regular checkups. I had no idea really what um, Alex wanted to speak to me about. It, um, it intrigued me slightly. My daughter had done some work for him as a research assistant for one of his books. And I don't know whether he was coming to share with me what a gorgeous daughter I had, um, which I knew, but it's always good to hear it from someone else. And he sat down, and you know, he's a, he was a, he's a tall, he was a big man. And my chairs, unfortunately, um, are, are rather low. It took him some effort to get, to get down. Um, and he said uh, he was very grateful for, for the time that we that we that I'd given him and he said I know you're a busy man I don't know why he said that but he said you know I have struggled with orthodoxy and the faith for many years to the point where I walked away from the church and I decided that um, the orthodoxy taught and preached in the exclusive manner in which it is didn't represent me any longer and he wasn't sure whether, in fact, he could still claim the title or uh, in any way hold to describing himself as a Christian in the sense that most people nowadays think of Christians being sort of gung-ho or something about something of the faith. He said, um, but the more I thought about it and... Um, and where um, I was wanting to have my memorial service, I knew that I didn't want it to be in a nondescript space, like a community hall down the road. He said he had received too much from the church and from Christians, and that would be a slap in the face to those who practice their faith with integrity, diligence, and often through great difficulty. And he said he wanted me, if I wouldn't mind, to conduct his memorial service. And as you can see, I really haven't done anything. <laughs> I just like sitting here checking. <laughs> but he wanted it here. And not just for his, its proximity to Constantia Place, I don't think. He wanted to acknowledge in the house of God, the God who had made and shaped him. The God who had enabled him to experience all that he did and give and provide him with opportunities to express the heart of that God in the manner in which he conducted his life and in the issues that he engaged and the causes that he gave his strength to. And he chose these two passages for us today. And when Andrew and Nick and I were sitting and talking through today, um, Andrew had great difficulty fighting back his emotions because he said the one passage that we want to have read today is the one from Isaiah 58. And he said, when I was in detention, my dad surreptitiously managed to get a Bible in and to me. And when I opened it, he had written in it this passage from Isaiah 58. Isaiah, of course, is one of those 
prophets, which if you've studied a little bit of 101 Old Testament, will know that it is really three people claiming the same name who write at different periods. But what is most exciting about this prophet is that the vision of a new world and a new way of relating as human beings to each other doesn't change. We will be hearing more and more from this great prophet over the next few days with words like, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you've increased its joy. They rejoiced before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have bro broken as on the day of Midian. What a wonderful nod from God to this his son, who lived long enough to see these words fulfilled in his time and for the strength God gave him to make a contribution to light yet another candle on the road. We are here to thank God for this, his son, for all that he was and gave. And as we too pick up that light to announce that love is stronger than hatred and hope greater, greater by far than despair. And that the value and worth of every single individual made in God's image is far, far more worth fighting for, standing up for, than anything else. It is the highest calling to live a life of love and care, a love of compassion and dedication to one's fellow travelers and pilgrims on the way. May God grant to him eternal rest, to his loved ones comfort, and eternal peace too. Amen. So friends, I'm going to ask you to join me as we pray the prayer which Jesus taught us in the language that our mothers taught us. Let us pray. Amen. Eternal God and Father, whose love is stronger than death, we rejoice that the dead as well as the living remain in your love and care. And as we remember with thanksgiving today, this your son, Alexander Lionel, together with all those brave soldiers and sons who have and daughters who have gone before us in the way of Christ, we pray that we may be counted worthy with them and him to share the life of your kingdom through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we pray for those who mourn. Pray for Jenny and the family. Pray for friends and loved ones, for fellow residents with whom they shared their life, for all who will miss you most and be most pained by this loss. Lord Christ, you spoke words of comfort to your friends Martha and Mary in their hour of sorrow. Give consolation and courage to all who mourn today, that they may find both their peace and their hope in you, the resurrection and the life, for your tender mercy's sake. Amen. And we pray for ourselves. O oh Lord, support us all the day long of this troubled life, until the shadows lengthen and the evening comes and the busy world is hushed. The fever of life is over and our work here on earth is done. 
then Lord in your mercy grant to us safe lodging, a holy rest and peace at the last. Amen. So I invite you to stand for the commendation. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing, only life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Saviour, we commend this, your son, Alexander Lionel. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Go forth now on your journey from this world, O Christian soul, in the name of God the Father who created you, in the name of Jesus Christ who suffered death for you, in the name of the Holy Spirit who strengthens you, in communion with the blessed saints and aided by angels and archangels. Into paradise may the angels lead you, May the martyrs come to welcome you and take you to the holy city, the new and eternal Jerusalem. May the choir of angels receive you. Those who have gone before you welcome you. And where Lazarus is poor no longer, there may you have eternal rest. And the benediction. Finally, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honourable, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good rapport, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things the things which you have both learned and received and heard and saw, these things do. And the God of peace will be with you. Our service is nearing its conclusion. We sing, uh, we, we listen to the song by Johnny Clegg, which was written um, when he lost his main um, dancer and um, friend and companion, um, we remain standing as it is played and it will play us out. The family would love you to join them um, in the hall next door for further conversation. May God bless you. Sound through swollen eyes, he sways and he's.
smiles Cause no one can put him down Inside him a boy looks up to his father For a son 